Today's webinar, hosted by Collaborative Drug Discovery, is entitled Identifying Human Protein Targets for COVID-19 Treatment. I'm Frank Cole uh, from CDD, and we'll be moderating a panel discussion with Brian Soiket and Nevin Krogan, both of UCSF. Gentlemen, welcome. Uh, and thank you for joining us to share your work and um, in UCSF and the QBI lab uh, with regard to COVID-19 research uh, that you're undertaking. In just a minute, we're gonna delve into your work and walk through the webinar content, but there is no doubt the scientific attendees in this session will have questions for you. So we wanna make this available uh, to please share your questions for Brian and Nevin for later in the conversation uh, by going to the Q&A section of the Zoom bar and posing your questions. So type your questions. Do not uh, use the chat. Uh, we're going to actually not use the chat for that so that doesn't disrupt anything that we're doing. So um, with that, I'd like to turn it over um, in just a second uh, to uh, Nevin and, and uh, Brian. Uh, there's quite a bit of information on Brian and Nevin in, on their website uh, with a lot of background and experience. So we're gonna leave that for follow-up for individuals who are interested in learning more about uh, both about Brian and Nevin's work over the course of time. So I would like to, at this point, uh, get going. So again, welcome to both of you. Thought I'd get started by uh, having you, uh, if you, if you would, individually, uh, give us a little history of your collaborative research focused on the pandemic specifically, certainly, and how you put together uh, collaborations over the course of time, and perhaps talk a bit about the QBI incubator and UCSF uh, initiatives. Sure, I can, I can start here, I guess. Um, Absolutely. So um, I will start by saying that the um, Institute, the Quantitative Biosciences Institute is actually five years old as of, I think, two days ago. Uh, and uh, one of the big um, focuses of the Institute is really collaboration. Uh, and it's about breaking down silos across different disciplines, bringing people together uh, that, um, uh, that are in different disciplines here at UCSF and in the Bay Area, United States, and and um, ultimately around the world. Uh, and one of the big um, focuses in the past has been to to make connections with other institutes in in Europe, in Africa, in 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 Asia, in South America. Uh, so we've been spending a lot of time traveling, setting up joint symposia, setting up joint funding opportunities, bringing the scientists together, uh, really around the world. And I would argue that's why we're in such a great position to pivot to, to, to start studying COVID-19 um, because we could exploit this network that we had put in place and when we started this you know QBI coronavirus um, research group and you don't just send an email or pick up a phone and, and start deeply collaborating it takes a long time we put a lot of effort into establishing some really great relationships that were brought to bear during the pandemic in particular with the Pasteur Institute that you know, Brian and I have been working closely with over the last year. We've um, set up a number of um, symposium and RFAs and MOUs with the Pasteur over the last several years. So that was great. And another uh, group is uh, Mount Sinai Hospital, Adolfo Garcia Sastra in the Department of Microbiology. We've been working with them for about a, a dozen years um, on a variety of, of different projects. So um, we had an infrastructure in place that we brought together obviously very, very quickly. And that was a key part of why we were successful in such a short period of time. Did you want me to show this? This probably gives a little bit of a... Uh, sure, yeah. Uh, um, this is a list of the relationships um, and the collaborations that were um, that we've been involved in over the past year. As I said, many of which were in place um, before uh, uh, the pandemic. Um, so obviously there's a, a big group here at, um, um, at UCSF and at QBI, but it is important to point out that we have got these connections around the world in the academic setting and in the industry setting as well. And it will be interesting to see, um, and I think we'll discuss this later, how this collaborative spirit will stay in place uh, when the dust settles on this pandemic and, and how science is gonna be done. I think it's gonna be done much more effectively, much more collaboratively, much more efficiently. Uh, and I think a, a big part of this will be that the industry academic relationships are gonna change in a very positive way, I think, for both sides. So there's been a lot of negatives here, obviously with this pandemic, but I think one, one of the great silver linings is um, the realization how fast we can move when we can all work together. And I'm very excited to be pushing in that direction for the next pandemic and let's study all disease in, in this fashion as well. 
Yeah, I actually have uh, little to add to that. Nevin's really been the, the leader in this effort, got us all organized. Uh, tremendous exercise in hat, cat herding. Um, I, I guess my only two contributions were, um, I, I, I think I was involved in uh, convincing uh, the powers that be at UCSF that a second Canadian should uh, <laughs> run this. And, um, and then I think uh, myself and uh, Kayvon Shokat and Jack Taunton, and of course, Nevin, uh, were involved in bringing some of the industry partners um, into close collaboration. Another snapshot of your group. Yeah, for, I think that was uh, four days before um, everything shut down. Well, it was no, it was, it was interesting. There was in the Chronicle. It was it was the March seventeenth. It was yesterday when it was the full shutdown in San Francisco. So that was a week before the um, um, the full shutdown. And this is the the scientists affiliated with QBI that we brought together. Um, over forty groups um, involving essentially hundreds of different scientists. It got lar so large we we've actually broke them into different subgroups, focused on different aspects of coronavirus research, um, including different focus on different processes, the virus hijacks, like translations So Davide Ruggiero led a, is leading a translational group, chromatin transcription, that's being led by Alan Ashworth and Denitza Fujimori. Um, you know, Brian and Kayvon, um, Jack, have been leading this uh, uh, drug discovery group within QCRG. And then another group I just wanna highlight because it's been super productive as well is the one focused on structural biology led by Oren Rosenberg and Clem Verba and setting up these unbelievable pipelines with trainees, bio, biochemistry and, and crystallography and cryo em and computation and you know moving incredibly fast in terms of characterizing um, the structures of not just the the viral proteins but the interacting factors as well and then you know weaving all of this together uh, in a really exciting uh, manner so that the foundation was started here at QBI and then people um, around the world have been getting involved and actually people have been coming to us now and saying you know this is fantastic what you know what, what's going on can i get involved and, and and what are you guys how did you do this how can we do this so it's been very exciting in that regard i don't know brian do you have anything to add on that no very good yeah good stuff there um so let's get to the first question the first question which is the topic of the day is specific to human protein targets uh, so why approach the human versus the actual viral proteins you want to start, Brian? No, uh, why don't you go for that one? <clears throat> okay, so um, obviously uh, for obvious reasons, uh, there's been a lot of effort in terms of uh, targeting viral proteins in general uh, because um, you're targeting proteins that don't normally exist in our cells and that makes sense. However, there's issues uh, in regards to doing that. Um, and one big issue is resistance, drug resistance. So viruses can, can mutate much more quickly than we can. And so that's an advantage of obviously targeting a host protein. We don't mutate, so we don't have to worry so much about drug resistance. So, um, and another plus here is if you target a human protein that the virus needs, I would argue it'd be incredibly hard for the virus to mutate around its reliance on that host protein. Uh, so that, both of those reasons, it, it, it makes sense to target a human protein. One of the, the reasons not to that people talk about, well, toxicity, well, one point to make is all other drugs hit human proteins for all their diseases, uh, right? And um, the other point to make here in terms of the toxicity, unlike chronic disease, this is an acute disease, and you'd have to take a drug maybe for a few days or a week instead of months or years. So I, I just think toxicity is not such a big problem when you're targeting a human protein to ultimately combat um, infectious agents um, uh, like SARS-CoV-2. So I think pharmaceutical companies are now starting to realize this as well. And, and there's been effort. I know like a Roche focused on um, host-directed therapies to combat infectious disease. Yeah, and the one thing I'd add to that, you know, from a drug discovery perspective is that if you're, if you're interested in repurposing, it, it's the human targets that, that are the richer uh, field to dig in because th there are, there's a lot of chemical matter for the human targets, and there's a lot of human targets. Um, so it made a lot of sense from that standpoint too. Yeah, you shared this uh, this graphic with us. Maybe you could speak a little bit to what this represents. Yeah, sure. The, so the QCRG very early on, um, I think we were the first group, one of the first groups to get all the genes synthesized. And obviously what we were using them for, first thing that we used them for was to 
um, affinity tagged and purify them and identify biomass spec to co-purify in human proteins so that Brian and Kayvon and Jack could look at them and uh, make predictions about drugs that, as Brian is saying, could be used for drug repurposing. But at the time, we just simply tweeted this out and said, look, we got these plasmids and we're happy to share them. Uh, no strings attached, no MTAs, no lawyers. I'm not a big fan of lawyers, even though there's a number of them in my immediate family. Um, so uh, it was great that we were actually able to send these constructs, these genes to over 450 labs in over 40 countries, really in a matter of, of weeks. So uh, that's been a big kind of focus of QCRG is sharing, sharing not just the reagents, but the data as well, as soon as we get it. So in this context, we were happy we were able to share these constructs very quickly to help expedite research on SARS-CoV-2 around the world. Very cool. Um, although this question, it seems like it's out of order. It's kind of interesting because what we're thinking um, as a take home message, because we look at coronavirus, certainly other viruses and other bacteria. So um, what, sh what if we should experience other outbreaks or uh, other pandemics? What's, a diff what's the approach that might be different for coronavirus versus a different coronavirus or other viruses or bacteria? You want to start, Brian? Okay, I'll start on this one. I think if it's if we have another coronavirus pandemic, we'll be in great shape, so much better shape than we were a year ago, um, because um, just so much more of its biology is understood now. I mean, the, the progress has been massive and almost overwhelming, and and even like something very simple but you know crucial for from a drug discovery standpoint is the assays we'll be working. One of the things that that hobbled us in the beginning and and still is a problem actually, is just getting the assays to work, especially for the viral proteins. And, um, and that's, we've made a lot of progress there. So if it's another coronavirus epidemic, I think we'll be in great shape, um, much better shape anyways. If it's another, if, if it's another virus or even a bacteria, um, I think even there we'll be in better shape because the mechanics of collaborating and, and knowing what we should do and working together, not just, you know, in uh, QCRG, but um, in, you know, around the world that a lot of the bugs will have been worked out. So I'm mechanically, I, even there, I'm, I'm a little bit more hopeful. Yeah. And maybe I'll just add um, a couple points um, on just to add on Brian's last point. I, I agree. I think the scientific community um, both in the academic and the industry worlds have, have really, learned how how they can fit together more effectively and and how we how as a crew as a uh, a group we can move so much more quickly so we're going to be in a, hopefully we've learned lessons here that we can then apply um uh, in the future and and another point i want to make just in terms about research and application to future disease uh, um you know even if it's not another coronavirus we've learned so much on so many levels that we can apply to the next disease. And just as an example, the, the vaccines that are now being used so successfully for SARS-CoV-2, a lot of that research was in, in uh, laid in the HIV world. You know, there was so much money went in HIV research um, to try to find, you know, a vaccine, an RNA vaccine. And, and a lot of what we learned there was applied here. That's another reason why we're able to move so quickly. So it's just a great example of more money in the research can benefit in ways you can't even anticipate until the next kind of problem comes along. So uh, I think on many, many levels, we're in a much better position. We just gotta keep this spirit alive and, and hopefully push more in this collaborative infrastructure so that we we will respond more effectively um, in the future. Yeah, and I would just say, and, and maybe get some structures in place to help with that, uh, both internally among scientists, but also, I mean, a government role is impossible. So it's, it, it'll be super helpful. Um, to set some things up, to have some structures in place, uh, to have, you know, there's been a lot of duplication, I think, in the last year and, and some orchestration would be really helpful. That's great. And I know we get to that a little bit later too. That's, that's great stuff. Um, you, you, you said a word, Nevin, that uh, made me think the word together, right? So we think about together and collaboration, but yet the environment of being together, you know, a family of humans, right? we don't hear that much so as for the laboratories maybe you can share the lab experience of balancing you know protecting personal health while still doing research for the common good yeah i mean it was obviously everyone is incredibly scared essentially a year ago uh exactly uh we did we knew so little about this um uh, virus and you know first thing we wanted to make sure that our scientists even though we're working on this virus were safe when they were coming into the laboratory setting um so we took you know, the, the I, 
in retrospect, I think the best precaution possible uh, in terms of cutting back uh, a density and, and the people that are here uh, um, taking uh, the, the necessary precautions. Um, and you know, as as we've gone along, I, to my knowledge, I don't think there's been a spread in a lab here at UCSF or, or at the Gladstone, and definitely not people working on the virus, absolutely not. But I don't think there's been a lot of spread here in the university setting. Um, maybe one or two cases over the last year, which is which is a testament, I think, to, to kind of the precautions that we put um, uh, into place. But um, but then the flip side is, you know, it comes at a cost too, not interacting with people. And you know, we're doing all these zooms one after the, the other, and it's in, fairly productive on one hand, but I see creativity gone down significantly. You don't bump into people. And, and those where you have your best ideas, right? As when you walk down the hall and you bump into three people and um, interactions that are not preordained on your schedule when you wake up in the morning. So I'm very much looking forward to getting people back and uh, getting them interacting more and, and inducing that creativity, not just on SARS-CoV-2, but on other areas that we've been working on. That's great. And that's elbow, elbow bumping to clarify, right, Evan? Yes. Okay, very good. Good. At this point, we're going to take a, just a short pause, I think. Well, that's not the one I wanted to show you, but we're going to take a quick audience poll. All right. Uh, Charlie, I think you've got something teed up for the audience to participate in some short questions. A short question. Hi. Yes. Yeah, so I have uh, launched a poll here that uh, the attendees should be able to see in their uh, Zoom panel. And we're just interested in you voting um, how you think research will change uh, from this pandemic experience. We'll give uh, all the wonderful attendees a chance to make their selection and read those options. Seeing the numbers coming in, that's very good. Thank you very much. I guess you could think about it as how would you like research to change as well, I guess. Is or, or how would you like research, yeah. <laughs> nice. All right, everyone, I think I will uh, stop the polling. The, the numbers coming in seem to have slowed. So I will end the polling in three, two, one. Perfect. And here are the results, everyone, if you can see. Um, so we're looking at uh, um, all of the above is a clear winner <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, for the uh, options here uh, with uh, academic and industry PPP uh, relationships uh, becoming more important or happening more often um, as the the highest individual choice. So thank you, attendees. I, I, I don't know, panelist uh, Brian Nevin, if you have comments, if this is surprising uh, to you, feel free to, to speak. Uh, otherwise, I will just uh, stop sharing these results and we'll move forward. It's good to me. Very good. Okay, right, fantastic. Frank. Thanks, Charlie. Okay, so back to the next question. I'm not going to share anything at this point, but uh, next question, of course, the question that we have to ask is, um, uh, what's your best guess on how the pandemic will play out? Of course, everyone's guessing, you know, but you're among those informed people. So I thought maybe you could share a little bit with us. I'm going to make Brian go first. <laughs> oh, great. Um, I, I don't think I have much to say beyond what people are reading in the New York Times sort of thing. Uh, it, in the you know, US, I think we're, looks like we're ahead, a little bit ahead of the power curve, which is great. Um, so, I mean, we, I think we could be in a really much better place by early summer. Um, seems like the rest of the world um, is, you know, has been slower to get their vaccines, so. Um, it'll be a little bit slower, but I, I, I do feel like um, modulo just, you know, what happens with the variants were, I'm, I'm, I'm cautiously ho hopeful. Yeah, I was, I'm also quite hopeful, although getting news back from Canada about some recent family and friends that have COVID now, right? I mean, it's, it's, you got to get the vaccine out and I, it, the, I think it's going to be like influenza. It's like probably every year we're going to need a shot. Um, and it's going to be with mankind, I think, for forever now, just like influenza. And therefore, we need to have drugs, and we're going to get to that, I guess, uh, mm -hmm. a, a mixture of uh, vaccines and drugs to be combating this every year. Very good. Uh, speaking of drugs, um, what's intriguing, specifically a uh, question about sigma receptors for drugs. Um, can you share what that is? Oh, yeah, yeah. 
Um, well, uh, sigma receptors were one of several key targets that came out of the initial map uh, from uh, the, the proteomics map from Nevin's lab. I don't know if you have a slide on that, Frank. I do. Let's see if we have the ones that you'd like to share. Um, so we have, let's just get rid of the shared results. Here we go. And yeah, so we that's my book. Right, there right. we go. Oh. oh, back one. Do you want to describe the map first, Brian? Why don't you go, actually, you're best to describe the map, Nevin. Um, okay, so uh, as we, uh, as I alluded to before, we had the, the constructs, the individual genes cloned out that we sent around the world, and what we did was put affinity tags on them, purify them, and identify the co-purifying um, human proteins by mass spec. The, the, the map on the left there corresponds to the protein, protein interactions that we identified. And the red nodes are the viral proteins, the other nodes are human proteins, and we gave these lists of about 300, mm -hmm. over 300 human proteins to Brian and, and, and Kayvon and Jack, and they identified um, about 70 drugs or compounds that they thought would inhibit um, uh, a protein that we think would be highly enriched for the virus needing to infect our cells. Uh, we had tested um, all of them, I guess, in collaboration with scientists in New York, Adolfo Garcia Sastra, in Paris, led by Marco Vignuzzi, again, you know, exploiting our, uh, our network that we had in place um, previous to the pandemic. Many of them um, were uh, potent, and uh, actually uh, 26 of these are actually being used in clinical trials for COVID-19. Um, some were just monitoring, others were more heavily involved in. Um, there were a couple um, Sigma R1 modulators, maybe I'll let Brian talk about that now, and then I'll come back and tell you about some of the translational inhibitors that we've been pushing uh, along. Yeah, so the Sigma-1, we got, when we saw the Sigma-1 and Sigma-2 uh, um, modulators come out, the ligands come out, we got really excited. We've, those are sort of dark horse targets in pharmacology and have been for a generation or two, literally. Uh, and we've worked on them before. And so we were excited to see them. And we knew that there were a lot of drugs that hit um, the Sigma receptors typically as off targets. So we thought, oh, well, this is a great field to play in. We're, we're gonna, there's just a lot of molecules to work on. And, um, and so some of those were published uh, in the, the first, in the Gordon paper uh, last year, the first one came out in April. Um, and we continued to work on them and press, push on them forward. And we got some pretty potent molecules. Um, but what we began to notice is that the, um, SAR, the structure activity relationships on these molecules was pretty flat. I don't know if you have a slide on that, Frank. Uh, no, no, no. Yeah. There we go. There we go. Thanks. Thanks. So this is um, this is um, sigma one affinity. This was a lot of this was done with uh, Brian Roth and uh, Andy Cruz, Brian at Harvard and, uh, sorry, Brian at Chapel Hill and Andy at Harvard. And, um, and the, um, and the y-axis is activity on the, on the virus uh, done with uh, Marco Venuzzi's lab and Adolfo Garcia Sastra's lab in Paris and, and New York. And what you can see is that um, there's, there's basically no relationship between ligand activity and antiviral activity. Some things were super potent on, on the virus, but not that active on, they were active like, like tamoxifen, uh, but not super active and, um, and the reverse. And, and, and so that, you know, when a medicinal chemist sees that, you start to worry. Um, and then um, we noticed that some of these molecules were like, like amiodarone and others were like poster children for this weird toxicity effect, cellular tox effect called phospholipidosis, which you run into, you know, in just in, in thinking about med chem and, and it, uh, it just sort of popped for us. Um, and so we started to, to look into this idea that the, what was really going on with these molecules is that not that they were hitting sigma one and being antiviral, but they were inducing phospholipidosis. Um, so I don't, is there another slide, Frank? Yeah, so here's, no, one, one back. That one, yep. The other back. Yeah, could you go? Yeah, one more. All right, stop there. <laughs> so uh, these are some of the molecules we looked at in depth. 
Um, uh, and they, they're both from what we had been working on as sigma receptor ligands, but also um, from the literature. Uh, so a lot of molecules in the literature, not just our stuff, um, were these cationic amphiphilic drugs, notorious, it turns out, for inducing phospholipidosis. Who knew? We didn't, but it's true. This um, showing up on the top right is, the, um, is what cells look like in, um, with phospholipidosis. You get these whorled membranes and vesicular structures. You basically disrupt lipid metabolism. I, I noticed there was a question about that in the, in the Q&A. And um, so we, we took a deep dive on them, uh, the literature compounds on our own. Next slide. And uh, this is in collaborate. This was uh, where the collaboration with Novartis came in uh, really strong. This is a uh, work uh, really led by uh, Fra Francois Pognin and uh, Francesca Moretti at Novartis. And there was, it just turned out, so these are just images showing induction of phospholipidosis by these antiviral compounds, these drugs. And there was, you know, um, I won't go into it, a strong correlation basically between induction of phospholipidosis and uh, antiviral activity. And, and then molecules, we did the counter experiment, molecules that were really potent on sigma, like melperone, uh, but inactive, it turns out that was a big surprise, antivirally, did not induce phospholipidosis. And uh, I think there's just one more slide. Yeah, and so there was this, um, so this is just the quantitative uh, association. There's a really strong correlation, drug by drug, and then over all the drugs, uh, between induction of phospholipidosis and um, uh, antiviral activity. So we think that this is like a common shared mechanism. It's disruption of lipid homeostasis, uh, especially in the lysosome, but throughout the cell. And um, it's antiviral uh, for our sigma molecules, but actually for uh, between a third and, and a little bit over a half of the repurposed drugs published over the last year. So I think it's a shared mechanism. It's a surprising mechanism. Um, maybe it's exploitable in itself, but right now it's mostly acting as the confound. And I think it'd be going forward. This is one of the things I think is great for going forward. We'll be able to eliminate this, this confound and, and focus on the molecules, that, the drugs that are, that are really effective, many of which we are advancing um, uh, in, in our own work. And I know other people are too. Very good. So that's, that's the second story. Great, great. Okay, so uh, we saw a slide earlier on, I'm not gonna, gonna stop sharing for a sec. Uh, a slide earlier on the Nature paper, right, that he published. Uh, what about the downstream targets of the Nature paper? Um, how, how does one guess the best RDS targets and pathways, pros and cons of hitting target directly, uh, interactions with uh, COVID-2? You want to pull up that map again, uh, slide? Oh, that for sure thing. Let me go make sure I'm on it before we do that. The map is right here. Absolutely. Lots of beautiful slides, guys. Here it is, the map. And technical difficulties beyond our control. Here we go. I think, I think it's a couple up from that. Yeah, it's up here, uh, right there. Yeah. There you go. And I guess uh, one thing I would say initially to that question is, um, you know, not obviously being an expert here in, 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 in drug discovery. I mean, I always thought you had to do, all right, a lot of biology, you had to do protein, protein interaction mapping to find proteins, you had to do genetics, and then you had to do structure. And then you'd you know, work with Brian and Kayvon and Jack and say, okay, let's use the structure and exploit it to try to come up with a compound. I mean, but one thing I was very surprised about and actually was excited is the fact that you could actually go from protein-protein interaction maps to make predictions that ultimately could have, uh, in this context, therapeutic value. And uh, we're starting to shift our focus in our other disease areas and, and, and saying, look, look, what can we extract out of our, our proteomic uh, uh, maps? And Maybe that's a good segue to um, some of some drugs that we are excited about. So there's a strong connection with translational regulation in the protein-protein interaction map um, from a couple of the, the viral proteins. Um, one of them here is, you can see on the right, is called zotadafin. This is a translational initiation inhibitor. Um, a connection, again, that came from the map. Kayvon had 
He said, oh, okay, we have this drug. It's actually from the company Effector. Uh, it's a compound, it's in clinical trial. Um, Kayvon was one of the co-founders of Effector. It's being used to treat multiple myeloma. Uh, and this had has potent antiviral effects in a laboratory setting. The FDA has approved a clinical trial for this. That's gonna be starting very soon. That's gonna be funded by DARPA. Uh, so that's one connection. Um, another one uh, that I'll go into a little bit more detail on is um, the drug Aplodin, and it inhibits translational elongation. It is from the company uh, Pharmamar. Uh, and um, ironically, they're also been, this has been approved to treat multiple myeloma in, in Australia. Uh, and maybe to go a little bit more detail into that on the next slide. There it is. Uh, yeah, this is, this is work done collaboratively with Adolfo Garcia Sastra and Chris Wright and, and Kayvon and Marco and others. So there's the drug in the upper left there, um, the structure of it, um, aplodin. It's actually called aplodin when it's used to treat um, uh, uh, multiple myeloma and plididepsin when it's used to treat COVID-19. There it is binding to its target EIF1A. That's not work from us. That was previously characterized. And interestingly, it comes from the sea squirt that it lives exclusively off the coast of Spain there in the upper left-hand corner. Then in the middle upper part there, um, what we're showing is that it's incredibly potent in, in a human cell there on the left and HEC293 cells expressing ACE2. Um, our collaborators have screened a lot of compounds, both in New York and Paris and around the world. Um, this is by far the most potent one that we've been associated with. It's 30 times more potent than remdesivir. It's at sub nanomolar IC90 value. Um, with the bar graphs there, the black and the red bar graphs, I'm just sh showing you that it's also potent in primary lung cells um, at a lower concentration than um, uh, remdesivir as well. Um, on the bottom there, um, there's mouse models that it also has where you can test these drugs, where you can introduce human ACE2 and using an adenovirus and you can infect the mice with SARS-CoV-2. You add drugs, you extract the lungs and you look at viral titers from the lungs and the bar graph there in the bottom in the middle is just showing you get a reduction, about a 500 fold reduction of viral infection with aplodin at a much lower concentration that's being used for remdesivir. And, and seemingly much more potent. And um, in parallel to this, we've been uh, collaborating with the company Pharmamar that, that makes this drug to treat multiple myeloma. And they completed a phase two clinical trial data. We're actually putting this paper together uh, for submission, I hope next week. Um, and that data, that trial to date looked in, um, incredibly uh, promising. And um, if you just go to the next slide, just uh, about a week ago, uh, it's been approved for phase three clinical trials for COVID-19 at 27 different sites across uh, 12 different countries. And the trials eva evaluate, uh, evaluating um, the combination of aplodin with dexamethasone and comparing it to standard of care, which is obviously um, um, remdesivir. Um, so uh, you know, hopefully this will be another um, uh, tool in, in the toolbox that we could be using to, to, to fight not just SARS-CoV-2, but, but, but future um, pandemics. And I just saw a question there in the question box about the, uh, a further uh, clarification on toxicity. And obviously toxicity is an issue, but what I'd like to point out here, again, is it's acute, you know, a few days maybe you'd need it versus weeks or months if you're treating multiple myeloma. And it's being used at a much lower concentration to treat um, COVID-19 than it's being used to treat multiple myeloma as well. So hopefully, um, for those reasons, toxicity won't be such an issue here in this context. And as I said, hopefully, hopefully we'll all be hearing more about this in the future. Great, great, great. Um, I'm going to leave this slide up, but the uh, next question was, uh, what was the biggest surprise or surprises from your current study? And uh, what's the next challenge in, in this space? Are they scientific or drug development challenges? If you can tell us a little bit about that. Brian, do you want to go ahead? Sure. Uh, well, okay. I mean, uh, the biggest surprise, I mean, in, in terms of the biggest challenges, the answer is yes. <laughs> uh, huge scientific challenges and, and drug discovery, drug development is, you know, its own, I mean, that's something where we're, we're really hoping to engage the, um, the pharma guys, right? Because they're the experts. Um, biggest surprises, actually, I was very skeptical initially, probably just out of naivety, that the uh, repurposing strategy would work, but I, th I think it's worked better than I anticipated. And, but on the other hand, the um, for me, you know, my, my narrow perspective, the, the phospholipidosis stuff was a, was a big surprise. And and um, initially, it was a nightmare. 
uh, and and now it just seems exciting. But um, it was it was a bit, definitely a cold splash of water in the beginning. Yeah, I guess what I would say is I kind of elaborating on uh, Brian's comments the the realization that these different disciplines fit together better than I thought. You know, and it was really out of fear. We're like, we got to force something together. Let's see if we can, you know, if, if, if what we do is, is more synergistic than we previously thought. And the answer was a resounding yes, which, which is fantastic for, for not just this problem, but all the other problems. Uh, so to me, that was a, a, an incredibly pleasant surprise. Um, and looking forward, I'd love for us to, in 20 years to look back and say, oh, look, look at all the great things we did because of this pandemic, because we learned we could work together where chemical biologists and uh, systems biologists and virologists, you know, are are working together incredibly effectively. And and I really want, as we were talking about before, this infrastructure to, to stay in place so that we can work on other diseases um, uh, like this. And I guess another surprise I just allude to, um, and it it's kind of why, in many respects, there was some success with drug repurposing, is that there's such commonality across different diseases, and we kind of knew that before. But this work really drove it home. I mean, it's the same genes that are mutated in cancer that SARS-CoV-2 hijacks. It's the same genes when you look at, say, Zika virus and neurodegenerative disease. It's similar genes and in, in proteins and pathways and complexes that uh, uh, come up. And, and um, it's the realization that there's not just connections between genes and proteins and diseases, but between those people that work on the different diseases. So we really need to get people that are studying neurodegenerative disease connected with those studying virology and, and those studying cancer. So um, I, I think that point is driven home even more now. So uh, to me, that was another nice surprise is the realization we got to get people working together across so many different disciplines because there's that's where the big discoveries are going to come in the shortest amount of time. Very good. Um, the next uh, next thing on our list is uh, looking at combination therapies. I think you talked a little bit about this earlier, but maybe you can go in a little bit further. Uh, what will be most successful? Do you want me to start? Uh, yeah, right? why don't you start on that one? Um, so obviously that's something that we're looking at. Uh, you know, one of the classical examples of this in the world of virology is obviously HIV, right? Where you, it's where the, the cocktail came into play, where you got um, uh, such great value. And it was initially one drug against one HIV protein that worked for a while, you got resistance, and you got another drug for another one that worked for a little longer, and then you got resistance. And it was really a mixture of three drugs that overcame this um, uh, resistance um, uh, issue. So um, you know, going forward, we're actually involved in you know testing different combinations, um, both uh, targeting the host and, the, and, and maybe the virus um, um, as well. Um, and it's interesting to think, like we're talking like a number of translation drugs and there's other ones that we haven't alluded to. One would think, well, maybe you need to hit translation and then you got to hit a signaling pathway and then maybe you hit an entry or something, right? And so maybe that's a good strategy. But Eddie Arnold at Rutgers reminded me with HIV, one of the best cocktails for HIV are three drugs that target the same protein, reverse transcriptase. Okay, so that's interesting to, to, to keep in mind as well. So maybe, um, interesting to see what Brian says, well, maybe two or three translational inhibitors together uh, at a much lower concentration, obviously, individually, that could have an effect as well. So it's, it's, it'll be interesting to, to test some of these uh, uh, drugs, and maybe it's a couple of host factors, maybe it's a host factor again, the virus. Or, so um, I think we got the toolkit to kind of test some of these predictions. Yeah, I, I think that's quite possible. I mean, when, when you think about the, reverse transcriptase and the translation inhibitors, they're, they're both acting on, you know, large articulated machines with multiple sites. And that's, that's how come you can get the synergy, but it, it's even more so for the translation inhibitors as all these different stages and all these different parts of the machine. I think it's also, you know, you look at uh, antibiotics, it's the, the, also those big machines that are often the targets and, and you can get synergy. So both within target, but I think even more so, um, you know, with multiple targets, a human target and a viral target. I, 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 I think there's a lot of promise there. Cool. Um, so what do you think about, uh, in terms of drug therapies, you know, even though we see successful vaccines coming to fruition here, deployed in a large scale, what do you think about the timelines and the impact of, of actual drug discovery versus repurposing and vaccine development? How does that all come together uh, at this point? I'll let Brian talk about the normal timeline of drug development. 
Okay, yeah, the normal timeline, as everybody on this call knows, is uh, quite, quite long, you know, 10 to 15 years, and we j just can't wait for that. Um, so uh, yeah, definitely think there's an ongoing role for, for repurposing. And um, in terms of, you know, drugs versus vaccines, I feel like this pandemic will, will be with us, not as a pandemic, but we'll be living with, uh, you know, SARS-2 for, for a while uh, uh, and, and variants, and, and we're just going to need drugs to treat people because the vaccine doesn't help you once you've been infected, obviously, and a lot of people are still getting infected and will continue to get infected. So I think there's a real role for drugs. And again, just to reiterate, I think it's conceptually, I mean, it'll be similar to flu, right? Every year you get a shot and then you need drugs as well. You need a combination approach. And I, and I maybe coronavirus will be a little different, but I, I, I think it's going to be at a, at a high level, very similar to influenza. Got it. Um, here's, a, here's a good one for you. Uh, reaching back to the poll we took earlier, uh, we asked the attendees to, to, um, to kind of select their thoughts about collaboration. What do, what do you guys think in terms of uh, scale and, and coordination of collaborations like the one uh, put together for COVID-19 globally? Um, you, know, what's, you know, what could be done? What, what should we do to avoid or minimize redundant uh, efforts? Maybe, maybe I'll start. I mean, I, I, personally, I've, I've always had a lot of issues with the scientific enterprise in that mm -hmm. it's really set up, in my opinion, to reward individuals. You know, one person gets a grant, one person gets an award, one person gets tenure. And I think this is particularly pertinent for younger investigators. They come in and they got great ideas and then they want to collaborate and then maybe they get burned or they get stung. You know, they get up for tenure and like, you know, we've been on these <laughs> tenure committees and people say, well, why are, you know, great productivity, but why are there 30 authors on that paper? What did you actually do? Or in a study section, you hear the same thing. And I always think the opposite. I'm like, wow, this person can collaborate with 29 different people or 49 different people. That's a great skill. So it, 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 that kind of mindset has to change. And all of this, in my opinion, is connected to money at the end of the day. The, the, the agencies that give out the money, I would really like them to uh, reward collaboration. You look at NIGMS and what they've done, to, um, you know, that's the biggest basic research institute in, in our country they're going away from collaborations. You know, John Lorsch is saying, we're just only gonna fund sole PI R1s. And the idea is not to not fund those, you need those, but it's also a balance between putting money into collaborations um, as well, like other institutes are doing. So I think it's really about, comes down to money. And I think the whole system in many ways has to change and reward collaboration, um, maybe just as much as rewarding the individual. And I think that will, help things overall. It's a, you know, it's a big ask, it, it, but I, I'm, I'm hoping that the pandemic is slowly pushing in, in, in that direction. And I think I would um, add to that and say just more in a more mechanical way, that's the difference between us. <laughs> uh, uh, it would be great if there was an articulate, a way to articulate collaborations to support them, uh, especially in response to, to an emergency like this. Because I, I feel like there has been a lot of duplication. Uh, it's nobody's fault. It just happened because there wasn't coordination. But it's not an easy thing to do because in an emergency, you really see the logic. But as soon as the emergency has gone, that logic fades really quickly. And, and so setting up something that can respond nimbly and be a good organizer and, and resource that, that, I mean, there's no money it won't happen at least not for not over time um that's really tricky and and i don't know exactly how to do that but i i, I really feel like it needs to be done and and cross collaborations uh, across countries i mean the virus yeah. doesn't stop at borders why the hell should we with our research right across countries and um yeah and across like industry academia and and there's been a lot of good work uh, we've been really uh, supported by it, uh, but by funders and industry people. But it's not, it's, it's not done in a coordinated way. It, you know, if the right person is there to support it, it goes forward, and if not, it doesn't. And and that's been, I think we could do a lot more there. And and I do think the redundancy you're alluding to, Brian, it's it's also related and connected to the competition, the competitive atmosphere. 
uh, in in our world, right? And and I mean, do we need 435 clinical trials on hydroxychloroquine, right? Um, and you know, part of that is is just complete disorganization, but a part of it is, you know, the 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 push for individuals to kind of um, instead of communicate, maybe pushing for themselves, and and they do that because of the system. The system is set up where they're rewarding the individual. So it's flipping things around at the high level and it's a hard ask to do, but I, I hope that the powers that be are seeing what's happening here in COVID and they're seeing the great value of, of um, using funds to bring people together instead of to have them compete. Yeah, and I think it can be done. I mean, if you look what came out of the Great Depression, all these institutional structures that are still with us uh, to, to deal with day-to-day -day stuff, but also to deal with emergencies. And I mean, we've just lived through this and are still living through this shocking event i hope i hope we can something creative can come out of it and then be sustainable you know the the, yeah. the nature of us is like all right we're 20 years from now we forget about this and then we go back to our old ways i mean the challenge is to set something up that's sustainable yeah yeah uh, that's that's the real challenge i totally agree but it is doable i mean you know we, we do have things now in the economy that that you know that kick in when an emergency happens and and actually they did that during the coronavirus and that was all set up in those in the 30s so it can be done for science too good uh, good discussions guys thank you great perspectives uh, i'll let you talk for a while but i know we want to get to a couple of questions so uh, we're going to go to have charlie read off some of the questions that we've accumulated since the beginning uh if you could charlie pose some questions to uh our panelists yeah hi everyone thanks for your great questions and uh brian and, and nevin i think i've seen you guys in the q a panel so if there's any that you have seen that you think you would um uh, like to bring up and discuss uh, in the webinar, that would be great. But I did want to start with one that just came in uh, um, relevant to kind of the last bit of your conversations. Um, have you thought really uh, what specifically should funders change to push through this um, collaborative process or, you know, uh, uh, collaborative nature more in a more long-term uh, scenario? Uh, you mentioned making it, you know, it has to be sustainable. Um, you know, what are your thoughts on how and specifics uh, that might help there? Any thoughts there? I guess a lot of stuff we've done in the past here at QBI has been through large collaborative grants. I mean, something concrete short term is um, more of that, you know, with, with with these larger kind of collaborative grant mechanisms like these P50s, EO1s and U54s and U19s. Um, and just you know, again, not to not not to take away completely the kind of the more traditional single PI R one type of studies. I think we definitely need those, but putting more money in into into that, especially at a place like NAGMS, where all the a lot of creative, innovative stuff is happening, it would really behoove the basic research community to put money into collaborations at NIGMS. Um, I, again, that's just my opinion. Others don't agree with me, but I feel, as you can tell, quite strongly about that. So, just 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 using money, using funds in a way that bring people together. That's, to me, that's, I mean, I, the people that don't normally work together, because I think that's where the really exciting things happen. And I think that the pandemic has showcased that in spades. Yeah, and I saw that, that was a question from Frank, Frank von Delft, I guess. And uh, I, I think that I would like to see some, something set up at, you know, at the government level and even at the maybe trans government level like the UN or something to respond to you know an, an emergency set up the collaborations just or the structure through which a collaboration could happen just it, it has to be um agile and and powered and and waiting for something to happen so it's a really hard thing to do I understand that and maybe it can be you know run in trial mode uh, well, now when before something else happens, but I think everybody recognizes that something like that really needs to happen. But I, I don't know exactly. How, there's, there's, you need a really good politician. Actually, this is what this is why politicians, a really good politician, can save the world, literally. And um, and I, I'm not that person, but I I know the need and I have in mind the sort of structure that would help. Um, but it would be it would be great to have politicians involved in this. That's what we need. 
Well, and with the Biden administration appointing a cabinet member as a, sci a scientist as a cabinet member, hopefully that's being pushed in the right direction. And I, and I should say there ha there have been, as Brian's alluding to, positive things that are that are happening. I, this active program, right, that's being you know Francis Collins and Tony Fauci with the heads of different pharmaceutical companies trying to prioritize what clinical trials get done. So you know stuff like that I think is incredibly powerful. That that gets rid of this redundancy that we've been talking about that wastes everybody's time and money. So I think there are things like that coalescing which are quite exciting and the challenge as we're saying is, is to try to keep those infrastructures in place and then and augment them when we're not so freaked out about a particular virus right i mean that's to me that would be the the huge challenge perfect all right guys thank you very much so um uh, maybe a a bit of a specific question here do you think future uh, covid drugs will have to be orally available or would a biologic requiring a re an injection not an infusion uh, that was effective against all strains um, and, and that used human targets be of value. A any thoughts on, on kind of the future of, of COVID drugs in that regard? Right. Well, it just depends on uh, the setting that the drug is administered and, and you know, how far the disease has progressed. In the hospital, an injectable drug is, is actually preferred, right, for all sorts of indications. So there's nothing wrong with that. Um, in the community, uh, you know, for early stages, of, you know, for people who are, who are just getting sick, or certainly prophylactically, if that can be imagined, um, you, an, an oral drug has huge advantages. And it, just to make the point that antivirals work early on, and when you're in the hospital, it's almost, it's many times, many ways too late. And that's why you get these anti-inflammatory drugs. It's not the virus that's causing the trouble, it's your body's response to it. So when you're in that stage, the antivirals, I mean, the antivirals are better earlier on. And that, that's the issue. So just like with flu, I think oral drugs, are, you know, earlier on are probably going to be, hopefully we have some of those for these coronaviruses. All right. Um, I think we'll take uh, a couple of more here. Um, so this comes from an academic lab. Our students are synthesizing uh, close analogs of known inhibitors of the SARS-CoV-2 uh, main protease. Has anyone implemented uh, a student run in pro assay in a lab as part of an educational program. Uh, are, are, are the academics kind of stepping up and, and joining the party, so to speak? And if so, you know, how could we um, help facilitate linking them together, um, the chemistry and the biology in, within this kind of educational framework as well? Can I, maybe I'll start on that one. So. Uh, we we did that actually with um, with three uh, cell pro the, the the main protease where we it was part of a class we ran where they did docking against it and then tested the molecules and and, uh, and they actually got some inhibitors some uh, pretty decent inhibitors uh, so I think that's totally possible I think it's a wonderful idea and and uh, I don't know who asked the question but. I think we, we, you know, we'd love to collaborate on that and uh, both for teaching and other things. And, and then, you know, I, I, I know I just, Frank was, has been, Frank Von Delft's on this call and he's led this, uh, you know, just thinking about uh, major protease that they, they've been the premier group leading uh, the charge there. And, and so I would contact them as well. But I think, I think that's more broadly, it's a great, a great question and a great opportunity at, you know, just as a teaching thing and, um, and get to get students involved and they can, and, and, and they're, if they're right at the coal face, you know, it's not just, it's not just learning, they're actually doing something useful. So I think it's a great idea. Well, and I think it, it, it's worth pointing out the, one of the subgroups of the QCRG, the structural biology subgroup led, led by Orrin Rosenberg and Klimberba, they put, they got together 60 different scientists from 18 different labs, mostly trainees, uh, uh, students and postdocs that, that came together and were working on a number of aspects of biochemistry of the virus and, and learning a ton too, right? And, and uh, so I think it's an example of, again, using a pandemic or using a tragedy to kind of bring people together and bringing students together to work together on this is I think they've learned so much and they had such a good time. Perfect. Yeah. Thanks, guys, for that. Um, I guess one more. I, my, my timer just told me we're getting to the end of our hour uh, to be respectful of everyone's time. Uh, a question on reproducibility and consistency uh, of experimental, resu experimental results. You mentioned, you know, bringing together such a worldwide collaborative team and how important it is to really not have boundaries and um, working uh, on 
you know, things like pandemics and so forth. Um, but we experience a, a low reproducibility and consistency of experimental results worldwide, you know, testing the exact same molecules. Um, it, redundancy may be is the way to not bias all the effort on a limited set of experiments. Can you comment on maybe how to, what approach would help with that kind of dilemma? Can I start, Brian? So I guess in our, just as an example with some of the initial work we had, um, uh, the fact that we were doing screens both in um, uh, Paris and New York with the same drug, what gives us more confidence. Uh, you know, obviously you need some redundancy to see, to get an assessment of reproducibility. You don't need 400, you don't need it done 400 times, but maybe a couple times, it's not bad. Um, so we tried to do this with, we tried to do this with, with our drug work as well as with our genetic work when we're looking at the host factors, knocking genes out with different genetic perturbation strategies and different cell types with different assays. Um, so we try to implement that and obviously we can, the wider the network is. But the other point I'd wanna make there is, what we really focus on is where different data types point you in the same direction. Okay, so that's another way to think about reproducibility even under the same kind of umbrella here at, at QBI or at UCSF. If a protein protein and a genetic and a structure type of information all point you in the same direction. I've never seen that not be you know, worth following up on. So I think that's a, a key part here is back to this idea of putting these different technologies together. Um, if you just have data from one technology, I'm, I'm like, ah, maybe it's something, maybe it's not. But if a second one tells you the same thing, yes, a third one, it's, a, it's like a slam dunk that now may not have therapeutic value, but it's gonna be biologically interesting. So for me, it's about putting the different technologies together. And if they all point in the same direction, then that's worth following up on. Very good. It looks like in the interest of time, I'm going to share one more thing, and that would be, um, again, thanking Brian and Nevin on behalf of CDD, Charlie and myself, and the CDD team. Thank you for an amazingly interesting discussion. It uh, was quite uh, nice of you guys to carve out time to, to, talk, to talk to us all about this, and, uh, and I'd also like to invite the, um, the folks on this call to come back again. Um, we actually do other uh, other good things on a monthly basis where we offer uh, other great webinars or we're involved in other, other places. And um, in April, we will have a webinar on BioHarmony, the drug, uh, drug data store. Maybe we'll, if you tune into that, you'll see something on Appledin. <laughs> and then also uh, we're working on the Pistoia webinar, which is next week uh, on BioHarmony Annotator and Pistoia Virtual Conference, which is the 20th and 23rd. And um, that's it for now. I want to thank everybody again for their participation and their great questions. Uh, and again, thanks uh, to Brian and, and Nevin for your time. It was a great, uh, great conversation.